Cuban Missile Crisis is up to today the world's most famous recorded instance of brinkmanship. The highly polarized conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union saw society at the brink of a full-blown nuclear confrontation. The main question is, how can we even begin to understand the conflict or strategies employed by both sides? And how can game theory aid our comprehension of the crisis? Game theory is very much a branch of economics that operates based on strategic decision making. The process of making choices that maximize your personal utility. In this case, stakeholders weigh each decision possible and attach a numerical magnitude to each choice. Ultimately, the decision that yields the highest benefit is ultimately chosen. A graphical representation of this is seen on screen. A series of interconnected nodes suggests interactions between players. Each circle represents a player, while arrows represent the actions available to each stakeholder. Bracketed numbers at the sides are the payoffs on numerical outcomes that are available from the confluence of such decisions. Ultimately, anything in life can really be converted into a game of sorts and analyzed in this very manner. Let's take a look at the rather simple and arbitrary example to see how this kind of works out in our real life. Say your friend invites you out for a cuppa. By turning the situation into a game, we say you can either accept or decline that offer. If we were to accept that offer and go out for coffee with a friend, then you know you have to make a future further choice of drink, be it a grande or a tall. If we say, for example, that getting a tall is better than a grande because of the associated reduced sugar consumption, then we're going to assign a higher payoff to tall than grande. Extrapolating backwards, if we say accepting that offer is going to be better than declining because it would be nice to meet someone you haven't seen with in a while, then we're going to give a higher payoff to accept than decline, and that is why one is greater than zero. Ultimately, what we've just done is we've obtained the rollback equilibrium via backward induction, except tall, which gives you the complete list of actions or strategies that give you the highest utility, or in layman terms, make you the happiest. But you may be wondering, how does this model or line of logic even apply to brinkmanship? It'd be suitable for us to clarify what brinkmanship even means. Ultimately, brinkmanship is pursuing a policy that holds considerable risk to the very threshold or limit of safety. Experts largely concur on its definition in empirical literature as an activity in politics or international relations that means that you try to obtain your end goal by stating that serious consequences will arise should you not get it. In other words, it means you make use of a serious threat that has to be of a certain caliber and magnitude to push for a desired outcome. For example, in the dynamic scene in labor unions, who present escalating risk to cooperations through strikes in order to get higher wages and more just working conditions. But the most famous example of this deliberate loss of control and the case study we'll be examining today is the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was a 13-day conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, which brought the world to the very brink of nuclear confrontation. We see a timeline of this on screen. On the 15th to 16th of October, beginning with the United States discovery of Soviet-owned missiles in Cuba, when one of their U-2 planes flew over the site and captured detailed satellite images of Soviet-owned nukes, the conflict steadily escalated, especially when a US U-2 pilot was shot and killed over Cuba by Soviet soldiers. Yet, the entirety of the conflict ended in resolution with the United States agreeing to withdraw its Jupiter missiles from Turkey in exchange for the Soviet withdrawal of missiles from Cuba, as well as the establishment of a direct phone line between the two countries. How did brinkmanship play a part in this? And what was the rational and decision-making process behind this? On screen, we see an example of the conflict illustrated in a form that is very much reminiscent of our little Starbucks story just now. Here, upon finding out that Soviets hold operational nuclear weapons in Cuba, the United States has to choose between employing a strategy of brinkmanship, as we see in the form of a blockade that risks nuclear escalation and war, or doing nothing. 
Moving on to the next node and player, if the US chooses to engage in a strategy of brinkmanship, then the Soviets have to decide whether they're going to defy or accept that threat. Say we acknowledge the fact, or say the Soviets acknowledge the fact that there is obviously that risk of mutually assured destruction. Then they're going to choose to accept instead of defy the threat and assign a higher payoff of three instead of two. Extrapolating backwards, if we say that because of Cuba's geographical proximity, the United States is likely to choose to act and engage in a strategy of brinkmanship to protect themselves from nuclear escalation, then it's likely that they're going to assign a higher payoff to threaten than no, which is why four is bigger than one. Using rollback equilibrium, we've again obtained the end outcome, which is threaten accept. Yet, the problem with this simplistic analysis that kind of assumes the point of view of the United States is that it fails to consider if the Soviets are going to really accept the threat. That is to say, it kind of assumes the Soviets are softline. But the question is, what happens if the Soviets are hardline and are willing to forgo the risk of mutually assured destruction and decide to maintain their missiles in Cuba? That is to say, they value the strategic advantage and deterrence gained as critical and more important. Then we see that the outcome would be drastically different, and we know that the United States is unlikely to engage in a strategy of brinkmanship at all because the Soviets are definitely going to defy that threat, and after that, things would most likely get out of hand. But how are we going to reconcile these two options? To kind of reconcile these two disparate options, we understand there's an element of uncertainty. This is arguably far more realistic compared to the beginner watered down version that we started out with. After all, in reality, neither side can be completely sure of each other's intentions. The only thing you know as a player is your own motivations and your own tolerance. Thus, we see that this element of uncertainty can be introduced diametrically in the form of another little friend called nature which decides of probability P and 1 minus P respectively if the Soviets are hard or softline. And if you're wondering what that little orange circle is all about, that is an information set because the United States doesn't know which node they're at because again, they don't know if the Soviets are hard or softline. If the direct threat of war is far too dangerous, we reduce the magnitude of it by stating that it is simply a probability to be more tolerable. We call this a probabilistic threat. In layman terms, instead of saying you will do action X and this kind of consequence will happen to you, a probabilistic threat simply means it's more of a this may happen to you. So instead of this, we introduce a rather different kind of threat. You see here additional nodes in terms of an unknown variable Q. That variable basically defines the probability of nuclear war occurring if the Soviets defy the US in which mutually assured destruction would probably occur. Now we understand that this probabilistic threat is going to have to be incentive compatible in order to be successful in its purpose of allowing the Soviets to withdraw its missiles from Cuba. It has to satisfy two credibility constraints or conditions in order to be considered credible. The first is the effectiveness condition which basically means that the threat leveled at the Soviets has to be sufficiently high that it at least ensures that even softline Soviets are deterred from leaving their missiles in Cuba. If the value of Q is any lower than the effectiveness condition, then there's no point in employing the strategy of brinkmanship at all because the Soviets would defy regardless of whether they are soft or hardline. The second is the acceptability condition. Right? And we know the acceptability condition basically ensures that the decision to carry out brinkmanship is not so repulsive and its repercussions of war so dangerous that the US would refuse to adopt a strategy of brinkmanship altogether. Q has to be lower than this upper bound because if not, the US would be better off not doing anything at all. It is only when these two conditions are satisfied or when the probability Q of war lies between these two boundaries, will brinkmanship be successfully carried out and nuclear use be deterred? Now you may be wondering, how do these calculations and constraints even remotely help if you don't know the exact values of P and Q? We've gone through all of this mathematical derivation and we've plotted all of this in our very nice game tree, but how does this help us inform our decision to carry out brinkmanship if we don't know for sure if the Soviets are soft or hardline. 
That is when the notion of playing the game comes in. Both sides must gradually escalate actions in a slow buildup of risk to approximate whether the other side is soft or hardline to inform policy. This basically means that they take tiny, mini steps that slowly escalate. In the example of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the US begins, for example, with a tiny step in the form of a publicly televised address of the situation and a threat of the blockade before taking a bigger step in the form of implementing the blockade itself to see Soviets response and estimate if they are soft or hardline. And that was the game theoretical explanation of how brinkmanship could have been analyzed as a game theory economist. And that's the only one possible application. Game theory, this very method of thinking can be used to logically rationalize exactly why stakeholders make the decisions they do, be it climate change stakeholder response, to dual poly competition in the marketplace, to even protectionist policy. Infinite possibilities are unfurled at your fingertips when you take that first step, start thinking differently and playing the game. The tools to do so are right in your hands and it's your choice to make use of them. Thank you.